I see the recording. Oh, there comes the live stream. Okay. Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, our next session of the prepare uh, uh, panels that we're having uh, around the, the award that Monhav is leading for us. And I really appreciate the, the work that the team has done to organize these panels on a number of very good topics. Uh, in this panel, we're going to focus on the role of HPC in, in pandemic response. Uh, I've also asked for some folks to give a slightly broader perspective because uh, there's a, a role for HPC to play in, in a more general uh, crisis response. And uh, as, as some folks may know, we're beginning to explore that space and how we might better prepare this country to respond to crises of a variety of types beyond just uh, pandemics. And, and in many of those, HPC resources have a role to play or a role they could play to improve our ability to respond. And uh, you'll hear some perspectives from our various panelists here uh, from, from the experiences they've had some uh, over the last few years, some over the last couple of decades in, in playing different roles uh, that are relevant here. Um, so I wanna go ahead and, and get underway with everything here. Our first panelist uh, is, is Kat, which I have trouble calling her anything other than Kat, but Katriana Shea, um, who has been uh, of, of late working on something called the Scenario Hub. Um, and so I really appreciate her being able to come and present about her experience in, in leading uh, those efforts. Um, and with a particular bent on, on how this, this um, uh, how the HPC resources have, have played a role or not in, in, in those efforts. Um, as a bit of background, she's pri her primarily research interests are in uh, ecological theory and population management. Um, uh, she looks uh, at issues in, in, in invasion ecology, epidemiology, conservation and harvesting. Um, so there's a, a broad set of relevant uh, areas here. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, to Kat, uh, you Kat, so you can uh, share with us what your experiences have been. All right, can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to join this session. I had a really enjoyable time this morning and learned a great deal. I'm going to be presenting today about HPC challenges, particularly from the point of view of the Scenario Modeling Hub. Um, and so I'm speaking on behalf of a very large coordination team and also uh, many models that have contributed to these efforts. Um, and I'll, I'll call them out in, uh, in a moment. And I'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation and Midas for their financial support. Um, Let's check there. So um, the Scenario Modeling Hub, the COVID-19 Scenario Modeling Hub is an open hub um, and it collects and aggregates projections from multiple models. Um, we've had up to 10 per round uh, over multiple rounds from multiple modeling teams. As I said, they're no, um, particularly for US public health outcomes. So we're looking at case, cases, hospitalizations and deaths, usually over a six month time frame, but we've done some longer and some shorter um, projection runs as needed um, at the state and national level. Um, and this is in contrast to the sorts of forecasts that were discussed by Nick Reich this morning in this morning session, which are over just a few weeks. So the forecast would be what will happen, whereas we're talking about what would happen if we did this or if we did that. And for that reason, this is very much um, programmed around either bounding or somehow getting an idea about uncertainty, but also thinking about actions that we can take. So it's thoroughly embedded in the decision theory um, uh, framework. Um, and it draws on, as Nick Reich and Alex Vespignani explained in the morning session, if you were there, a huge and long-standing literature on things like multi-model flu forecasting, Ebola challenges. I personally was involved with a multi-model effort for Ebola, but it was too slow to be useful. Um, and we strongly draw from the forecasting hub in terms of computational architecture. But what we're trying to do is not say what will happen, but what would happen if we do different things. Um, and so this is a science policy forum that I had um, with colleagues, um, some of whom contribute to the Scenario Hub about using multiple models, but in a framework that's designed to reduce cognitive biases and is thoroughly grounded in fully operational decision theory to the extent possible. So we have both operational and research goals and we address uncertainty in three main ways. And it's really important uh, that 
um, that then makes it quite a large computational problem. We have multiple scenarios in every round with multiple models in every round, multiple rounds, of course, and then probabilistic prob um, uh, projections within each of these uh, settings. Um, and I just want to show you, again, the massive amount of work. It's not as big an, a, an exercise as the um, Forecast Hub, which is weekly with over 100 models. We operate on a roughly a monthly basis. Um, as I said, we uh, draw heavily from the architecture that was already in place from the Forecast Hub. So these open efforts are incredibly useful in providing uh, structure and um, uh, moving things along quickly in wartime, as everyone says. Um, and we have a large coordination team. And then these are the modeling groups that have contributed projections to any, any rounds. Um, and you'll see people like Madhav is here in the um, organizing this session, Alex Vespignani, who was in the session this morning and various other people who are on this call today. Um, and we also have CDC collaborators. Um, so we've had 12 rounds that you don't need to read these that address various issues largely of concern to our key stakeholder, which is the CDC. Um, and so sometimes we've done some very rapid rounds. And this is the sort of projections that we've come up with throughout the pandemic. We launched in December 2020. It took a while to get this structure in place, but through various variants. Um, and we share our projections directly with the CDC and the CFA, um, also with the White House data management team, CST, but also with WHO, local health departments. We have a public facing website and a lot of media interest in every round. Um, and our, our work has had some pretty, um, um, I would say impactful compared to work I used to do anyway, um, uh, uh, contributions. So for example, our round four was on vaccination and non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, we had an MMWR paper um, and a White House press briefing um, by Dr. Walensky, the CDC director um, in early May, 2021, summarized our results. And I'm not showing you all the models. What I'm showing you is the aggregate with the measures of uncertainty that makes it easier to present our multi-model results to uh, decision makers. And in this case, we had a two by two scenario design where we had uncertainty on one axis and a decision on another axis. But sometimes we just bound uncertainty Here's another example where, again, we were interested in what sort of decisions can you make if there's uncertainty, for example, about a new variant. Um, we presented information on childhood vaccination in the sort of reward side of a risk reward analysis for the ACIP, so the Advisory Community, uh, Committee on Immunization Practices, uh, the CDC, as it considered authorization and guidance on vaccinating five to 11 year olds. Um, and of course, um, over the holidays, we all worked flat out to do two emergency Omicron rounds that provided information, uh, again, to all our stakeholders about what might um, eventuate. And, you know, we've done quite a good job. Um, we're right at the end of our projection period, which was early or, um, April. And, um, and indeed, cases have dropped dramatically. And this is actually um, incidents um, with uh, um, depending on bounding the uncertainty about um, severity and immune escape in this instance. So there was no decision axis in this case. So that just gives you an idea of what we've been doing. But what I want to address is the question of this session, which is more about um, uh, what were the sort of challenges to adoption of uh, HPC resources in this um, hub. And so the COVID hub fairly regularly offered access to HPC resources to modeling teams, um, both via Midas and the COVID-19 HP consortium. So John Towns, who's the moderator today, presented stuff. And I will say we pretty much had zero uptake on those offers, all right? So I've been asked to talk today about why that might be. Um, and what I did was I actually went back to some work that I did on a recent sabbatical where I spent about six months thinking really hard about the literature on adoption of novel interventions and novel practices. Now I delved into this literature because I was trying to set up something like the Scenario Hub or think about ways to do something like that for decision theory um, and was interested in what would make people pay attention to this sort of thing. So the literature is vast because innovations come up in any field of endeavor and an innovation can have no impact if it's not adopted, right? So people really think about this a lot. And I went through masses of literature 
in from sociology, education, public health, all the things I've listed, agriculture actually was quite a useful one. Like how do you persuade people to adopt new weed control practices, for example? Um, and there are uh, many nuances to what I'm going to present in three bullet points. So this is not the total story. Um, there's a much more complex story, but three things are really, really critical about the stakeholder and about the innovation and about the person or the agency that's putting forward an innovation. The first thing is you need to hear about the innovation. So advertising is really important, but not just any advertising. You need to hear it from a trusted source. So we did that. John Towns presented on CDC Midas calls. Everyone involved in those calls knew and respected Midas. OK, so we definitely did the best job we could possibly have done on that front. The second thing is that for someone to adopt a new action or a new intervention, they need to see that it gives a clear benefit. So often this is in the form of a demonstration. In this case, because everybody uses computers anyway, everyone knows that a bigger, faster computer is better in principle. And again, I would say that this has not been a barrier to adoption. However, I do think the third thing is where we have struggled. And um, the, uh, I'm saying it as make it easy. Obviously, there are much more professional ways to say this. But basically, if you can facilitate uptake by making it as, as close to what a, a, a user does anyway as possible, you are much, much, much more likely to engender adoption of a novel um, uh, innovation, or in this case, um, what we were interested in is using HPC resources as offered. So I'm going to go through very much as um, particularly I think uh, Nick and Alex did this morning, talk about the issues that I've seen from the point of the scenario hub. And I only have one slide of hub issues. And the reason is because Nick Reich did a ton of that architectural building that we just leveraged in our use of the forecast hub um uh, architecture in in the scenario hub plus we had smaller uh, numbers of contributors we have longer runs six months but much fewer uh, far fewer teams um, even though we have four scenarios so we in the scenario hub deliberately started with four scenarios we discussed eight or more um, as a possibility but we needed to actually get people to buy into the hub. And so we kept it simple enough to engage teams in the first place. And that is a sort of um, starting point or anchoring point that um, in some senses we've come to regret and discuss later, but it was the only way to get this thing off the ground. Um, and so that's actually something that uh, restricted the need for high, uh, high access to computational resources just because we kept it simple so that people could do it with what they were already doing. Because at the very beginning, we did not have these things in place. We actually quickly lost one team when asking for probability, probability distributions because they wanted to just do point, um, uh, point estimates. Um, and so we already knew that it was a vulnerable time if we wanted this process, this scenario hub to succeed, we needed to keep things going. Several teams basically told us what they could do and we scoped our requests to ensure their participation. Um, and so this is an example, as I said, of starting point or anchoring bias. Um, once the structure is in place, it is increasingly troublesome to change it. We have a dedicated website, we have architecture set up for our, um, for um, aggregating our projections and so forth. And it does become a sort of um, uh, challenge to then make a massive change. And interestingly, now that our structure has been adopted by the new EU scenario modeling hub that was just funded by the European CDC, I think this sort of historical point legacy will last you know, for good and for bad for, for a long time. Um, but I think what's more interesting is some of the team level issues that came up. And I would uh, like to go through these over several slides, thinking about it. And then I'll come back to you know, what would have facilitated adoption using the adoption literature um, study that I did during my last sabbatical. So the first one is there's absolutely no need. If a, a team already had access to all the HPC resources it needed, then there was a no brainer and there's no need for adoption and therefore there will be no adoption, right? So that's a very obvious one that at least deserves a mention. Some teams thought of using um, uh, offered resources as a backup, but at least once we saw an example where their own home institution system failed over a period of time, you could just see them going, well, it might be up in a minute, it might be up in an hour, it might be up in a day, I'll just 
you know, it's too much effort to change. We'll just stay with what we're already doing. Um, and so the hope that the existing system would come back online um, before you have to go to extra trouble actually stop them shifting to other resources. Um, there was an energy of activation that was observed. Um, many people during this last two years, as I am sure everybody is aware, are right at the edge of being able to cope. Um, right, they're completely operating on empty and going full war nonetheless. They've got no bandwidth to add more than what they're already doing. Um, and any uncertainty about the process of shifting across just like, oh, I have to fill in a proposal. Oh, I have to find a web page and read it. Oh my goodness, that's too much trouble. Really trivial amounts of effort were seen as barriers to adoption here. And then one that was not mentioned this morning um, among some that were, was sometimes um, there are actually massive security hurdles for some government scientists to adopt these sorts of resources. I don't think that's been mentioned anywhere, John. Um, and institutional barriers also exist to adopt Adoption in academia. I have, I mean, this is not the same thing, but I have some collaborations with institutions that won't let you use Dropbox or Google or whatever. And so it changes the nature of an interaction. That's just at the collaborating on writing a paper stage. But if you're actually talking about doing computational work, these are really massive barriers to adoption. The third one is, and, and I will just say my lists are not beautifully mutually exclusive because I mean, I've just been thinking about this since I was asked to give this talk. Um, it wasn't something I had, it was something I would have probably got back to uh, after the pandemic's over and we work out what we could have done better, but I'm just doing it a bit earlier. So this is not meant to be a beautiful, exhaustive and mutually exclusive list. So there's some repetition, my apologies. But convenience, even, so there's not just, there's two parts. There's the activation to even start doing it and then there's the energy required to keep doing it. So I've separated those out. It's easier just to simplify a model and remain with resources you're already comfortable using in many cases, rather than trying to make it more complex. Um, and certainly in times of stress, we fall back and limit ourselves to what we already know works safely and okay and correctly, right? Because you always move to a new um, resource and then you're really worried that you've introduced errors in the move. Right, so that stuff you thought was okay might suddenly not be. Workflow migration was raised as a big issue when I talked to some of my um, colleagues on the hub. Um, moving to another environment is really time consuming, or potentially even impossible once you've got an architecture built up. And Alex mentioned this in his talk also this morning, so I'm not the only one saying this. And then obviously, and we all know this, it's easier to run on the platform used for development. Unless the runtime system has an identical environment as the development system, there's always going to be the concern that something else um, went wrong in the shift. Um, and then there are some hub specific issues that I think maybe are not as general, but because we do multiple rounds, a shift is less easy because it's easier just to um, increment your code um, um, each time, just tweak it for the next question. And that's also that sort of entrenchment in what you've done before um, and uh, very much like an anchoring type bias. Um, it's not like a fallacy, I'm just saying it's, you know, once you've done something, it's easier to tweak what you've already done. And then the error checking issues just came up repeatedly um, because um, with the scenarios and over multiple states in the US, what we have is that you may expect different bugs across different parallel runs. So there might be state dependent um, data issues or scenarios have different parameters that diff trigger different runtime errors. Everything is sort of conditional on the specific ask of that specific run. And it's much harder then to set something up that can generically run. Um, okay, so I then thought about what could improve uptake given that I think, in my opinion, we're focused on the third of the main points I talked about to do with adoption, which is to make it easy. So I would echo what was said repeatedly this morning, which is that we need to plan ahead and set up these structures before any new outbreak so that the second you have a problem, you just slot into something that's already set up and tested so that that some sort of effort beforehand saves a ton of effort later. Okay, and I cannot stress that enough planning ahead. Um, I would suggest um, in the current state, you would remove perceived impediments to access. So no paperwork, no long instructions, no, I need to write even a one page proposal. Are you kidding me? Who has the time? You know, that's the sort of reaction that you can get from people. It's just too much. Can I just call someone and they'll help me? That is a much more sort of easy way for things to proceed. Um, incentives might be needed. That's an interesting one. Like I'm offering you help 
and I'm gonna encourage you to take my help by getting you giving you something extra it's a possibility um, I, I'm not sure I would advocate for it but it's something that we've thought about how do we incentivize team contributions to a hub the WHO is thinking about how to incentivize participation in modeling efforts for, for global level pandemic problems um, I personally think a person to help you both set things up and do it would be incredibly helpful. They could help with workflow migration, applying for time parallelization, whatever you don't know how to do in their, in the new system. Anybody that actually just was dedicated to helping you that you could phone for help, you know, when you're stuck would probably streamline this process. And that's just um, now my personal opinion. And then having some sort of dedicated virtual container, so an emulator for, for, for a, uh, development debugging and runtime would be really useful because then it's much easier to port it across and you're confident that you're not introducing errors so these are just some suggestions something um, that was discussed this morning was the, the importance of scalability um, and you know thinking about oh if I do this now and then I suddenly want to ramp up and do it for multiple diseases or multiple other scenarios or something else um, you know thinking about making sure that it's going to port across or build up or scale up is I think what I just said um, and then um, I am sure that everybody who thinks about this all the time can think of other solutions to issues that I raised in previous slides, but those are the ones that came out of discussions um, amongst uh, the Scenario Hub folks. So with that, I would be, um, I think the plan was to just wait till the discussion session. So I won't take questions now, um, but I would like to thank our Hub members, especially people on the coordination team who thought through these ideas with me, but also specifically um, Ajitesh Savastava and Matteo Chinazzi for input from the modeling teams on, on um, things that stopped them trying other resources other than the ones they already had available. So hopefully I've kept to time sufficiently and um, I'm happy to hand back. Thanks so much, Kat. I really appreciate that. Um, if, if folks have questions uh, for Kat or the other uh, presenters as we go through this, you can uh, drop them in the chat or uh, when, we, when we get done with the presentations, you can virtually raise your hand and we can we can call on you to, to ask some questions. So it, I wanted to make sure we got through the presentations first and then we can go into the discussion phase of this. Um, up next is, is is Fred Streitz from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, and he's been involved in large scale uh, HPC applications for quite some time. He's led some uh, Gordon Bell Prize uh, teams, <clears throat> both as a, a, an awardee, but also a couple of times as, as finalists. So he's got a lot of experience at running applications at scale on these sorts of resources. Um, I think it, as of Friday, he is officially on detail to the CDC and, and he will be helping to coordinate uh, development and deployment of computational and analytical capability at uh, the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analysis at the CDC. So Fred, you're up. Thank you, John. Um, make sure that I'm not muted here. You're good. I'm good, okay. Uh, so yeah, I was gonna give a little bit, so I'm, my background is a little different. Um, I will thank all three of us have very different backgrounds. see you now. Oh. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, as as John said, um, I've been chief computational scientist at Lawrence Livermore uh, for over a decade, uh, and and has been I've been involved in some very very large scale computing and and this issue of adoption that that Kat just had I think a, a great discussion on uh, is something that I have faced uh, I saw in my history here in epidemiology, which is very short compared to some other people on this call, but. But I've seen in basically every field that I've been involved in, and I'll get to that point in the end. But first, I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of my own background as to so you see the perspective that I have on this. So, about three years ago, I was I accepted uh, an assignment to go to Washington headquarters in order to stand up the AI office in the Department of Energy, and that seemed like an important task. So I was I was willing to make the jump to the East Coast, and and barely a year into that, as you all know, a pandemic happened. Um, and since I was already here, and because of my experience with high-performance computing, I was asked to be the DOE liaison to the COVID task force uh, to connect to you know whatever uh, re requests and you know uh, and, and needs they had to make sure that the DOE would provide computing resources, both hardware and and human capital to to, to solve problems. And so. For the last two years, I have been sitting with the data strategy and execution group of the task force, um, fielding responses. And I, and I organized a small 
a tiger team of, of people across the complex and, and, and requests would come in and we would, we would try to handle them. Um, I have to say that you know, from that vantage point, and I remind you, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I do know a fair amount about computing and how computing gets applied to solve problems. And so I, I organized these efforts, but I saw firsthand the, the kinds of questions that policymakers asked, the time frame on which they asked them and expected answers, uh, and, and, and how they thought that they were going to intersect with the modeling community, because I was sort of right in the middle of that. And... Uh, the, the questions ranged from, you know, from, the, I would say, the obvious kinds of things, you know, how many hospitalizations are we going to have? How many deaths are we going to have? How many ventilators do we need? Remember, this is early days. We were trying to understand how the pandemic, what, what the pandemic was and how it was going to progress. At the time, it was still very local. So we were, the, the, the discussion was all about hotspots. Can we find where the next hotspot in the country was going to be? The response was being organized at that point by FEMA. And because it was an emergency response and, and, and we would be providing information so that they would put doctors and nurses and PPE on a plane and ship them to, to Louisiana. And then they would need to know when can they pull them back because they need to ship them to Minnesota. And, and there were dozens of teams of people being flown around. And just a small aside, I was very impressed. FEMA was amazing in this. I mean, they really boots on the ground making stuff happen. I think that they, you know, watching it happen in real life was, it was very impressive. Um, but, but those were sort of, the, sort of, I would say, the obvious questions that you might imagine being asked. But then there was the less obvious things, uh, like what would happen if we close bars? Can you guys tell us what would happen if we close bars? Well, that's, that, that's, a, that's a more complicated question. I mean, you don't necessarily have a model for bar opening or closing uh, in, your, in your existing epidemiological model. And so they, they, but, you, but you can't just say, I have no idea. That's not an appropriate answer. You're, 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 so you have to do something and you start coming up with models and, 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 and putting all the caveats around them. I, I'm gonna make it clear. We didn't, we didn't come up with policy. We weren't suggesting policy, but we had policy decisions that were, they wanted some input on and you need to be able to come up with models that would sort of address those. And you can't say, oh, I'll, you know, it's gonna take me a month to do that. No, I mean, they needed answers usually by the end of the week. So these were days, you had days to come up with these responses. How, what are we gonna do with schools? Should we close schools? Should we go to a hybrid model? How can we safely do a hybrid model? If we close schools, when might we open them? These were all questions that, that were thrown on top of the modeling community. And I should also say it wasn't just, it wasn't just you know, me and my relatively small team. It was uh, you know, HHS Asper probably had the primary responsibility on this and they worked an enormous number of hours to get these things done. Many of you, the academic community, were directly involved in these in these requests as well. I mean, the the administrations took no, uh, did, they they cast a very wide net in order to get the information they needed. So, one of the things that became clear to me, first of all, was from from my history was was the the advantage of using HPC in this community. I'll get back to that in a moment. But the other thing was was the amount of the, the amount that we struggled with 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 the various code bases. Um, they were primarily either, um, well, they were too simple, so they didn't capture the complexity you needed. They were too brittle, so they may have been very complex, but very difficult to modify. And this was a very constantly evolving field, and you need to be able to modify things very quickly. Not scalable, so that you couldn't actually go move them easily uh, to, or even difficultly, to a, to a large computer and do something at, at, a, at a better scale. And of course, as I came to appreciate the, what is a perpetual epi problem, which is there's never enough data. You, you, you never actually have sufficient data on what's happening on the ground. The data you get is not always accurate and it's not always accurate both in quantity and often in time. And given that you're trying to model a time series, getting inaccurate in time data is a, is a problem. Um, so as, as, as the year, uh, year and two years now progress, we now have a handle on many, on many of those issues, but early on, this was a real problem. So need for HPC in the community. I'm gonna summarize this, I think, in, in four, four categories. Um, the first is, I mean, why would you use HPC as opposed to not using HPC? And this goes back to, to the point that Kat made about what, is, what are the, what, the, the clear benefit. She used the word clear. <laughs> I'm gonna say that it was, it was not clear to a lot of people that HPC was a benefit. And, 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 and uh, I mean, I think that we all, we all think that, and I, I thought that was obvious, but, uh, and I, when I talk about adoption at the end, I'll get back to that point. But okay, in my mind, the four clear, and I'll use that word, <laughs> reasons to use HPC in this problem are one, 
complexity. Um, to, uh, uh, as Kat said, you know, many people do not use HPC because they prefer to simplify the model. But the point is, you're always doing that trade off. If you're going to use smaller compute and you're going to be constrained by compute, you're going to simplify your model. Sometimes you don't want to simplify your model. The world is complicated and you actually want a complicated model that drives you toward HPC. Second one is scale. Um, at the end of the day, a, a pandemic is an aggregation of local epidemics. I mean, it, 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 the, the behavior all occurs locally, but, but it gets aggregated. Sometimes you can get by with a very small scale model because you're looking at a very small scale effect. But a lot of times, especially where I was sitting, where we're dealing with the administration and they, they're looking nas national scale, they need national scale information and you can't always just average things out. So the ability to scale or dare I say multi-scale, uh, you know, because not a single answer is usually sufficient. Um, flexibility, third thing. Um, you often pay the price with small scale compute by having fairly you know, uh, rigid models that you've coded things in to make it very modular, to make it very flexible, um, to handle, for instance, an arbitrary number of variants with a number of different disease parameters, to have different locations, each behaving, behaving differently, but you want to combine them together. You need the ability to introduce these variabilities, these variations in the code. And, and so that flexibility, I think, is, is hugely important. And, we, we don't, I mean, speaking about, uh, you know, looking at epidemiology going forward, the next pandemic may, may not be a respiratory pandemic. You know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, it, it, the vector is insect or, or, or something else. I think, did my video just freeze? Okay, there it's back. Okay, um, good. Uh, so the ability, if you're going to, I don't, I'm not going to suggest we build the one model to rule them all, because I think that that's a failing proposition, but you need to be able to handle various different disease vectors and various disease modalities in a way that's flexible. And the fourth, the fourth category is speed. Speed is absolutely paramount. And again, I saw this in spades at the very beginning of the pandemic. Many times the re, they wanted answers in hours and the best we could do is days, but in fact, we would have preferred to have months. Uh, and so how do you beat the fact that your statistics are poor if you have, to, if you only do two models, because that's how many you could run in the time it takes you to, in the time you have to give an answer, then you're very limited in your choices. If instead you could run thousands of models because you can simply scale it out, now you can have a very different view. You can actually, um, it allows you to do a much better job of calibration against uncertain data. It allows you to do things like uh, train reduced order models using machine learning techniques, which again require a lot of, of back calculations. It lets you do a lot of the scenario exploration that Kat was talking about. I mean, you, you, could, you could fill in, you know, multidimensional scenario analysis if you have the ability to, if these things took minutes or seconds instead of, you know, hours or days, you can imagine throwing a lot more zeros after the number of simulations you do. And that really affects your ability to handle statistics. And, and boy, there's one thing I've learned about trying to do something like an epi model is that, you know, unlike physics, <laughs> um, uh, people are very unpredictable. And ultimately modeling a pandemic is about modeling people doing things. And, and you need to be able to handle very broad distributions with very fat tails. Physicists try to avoid those worlds, but, but epi is all about that. Um, so statistics matter. And I'm gonna spend the last, the last couple of minutes, I just wanna say a couple of words about adoption. Cause like I said, I've seen this in a number of places before. This notion of a clear benefit, what I've run into in more than one occasion is that, and, and this was one of them, when you start explaining why you're going to do this with a much larger computer, with a much more complex model, there is an implied inadequacy in the approach that is currently being used. And people who have in sometimes, some cases built careers on the using the methods that they are using have very little interest in exposing that the work they're doing could be done better with a bigger computer. That's just not, that's not something that's interesting to them. And so there winds up being a social aspect to getting the adoption to happen. People have to say, oh, I want to improve this as opposed to doing what I'm doing now, which has worked perfectly well for the last 10 years. Uh, Kat's point about being easy. Wow, uh, you're right. Very, very small barriers made big differences. But sometimes it's, it's coded in, in a sense. Like I remember there was one code that was being used that was written entirely as a package in R. And it was a very capable package and we had wanted to exploit that on a much larger machine to blow it out to a larger, to a national scale model. That took an enormous amount of effort. We eventually got the code running up on, a, on, a, on, on some of the NERSC nodes, but 
you know, it didn't have to get written in R. You could have done this in a different way. There, there you know, it, it's, it's these small barriers become very large. Um, and planning ahead is is absolutely the key. And so I'll, I'll end with that. So, but but we now now we are designing one you know we we are building the center for forecasting and outbreak analytics and and uh, i think we have the opportunity to think more carefully about how we build the infrastructure to use hpc wisely uh, for the problems we have coming ahead thanks fred that's that was excellent uh, appreciate your your perspectives on things again if you have questions for fred um once we get to the to the end of the presentations um, you can uh, drop them in the chat or or virtually raise your hand um, and we'll be coming up to that shortly um, next up uh, we have sean brown from uh, pittsburgh supercomputing center somebody i've known for some time and has been involved both from the epidemiological modeling side of things and in, in sort of earlier in his career and more recently on the on the provider side of resources so i think he has a couple of interesting perspectives uh, uh, to provide uh, from from those experiences in, in his past. Again, much of his research has been on um, research and decision making in, in public health, neuroinformatics and, and high performance computing uh, and related areas, uh, software platforms and, and such. So, um, Sean, it's all yours. Great, thanks. Uh, you can hear me okay and yes. you can see my slides. Okay. Yeah, your slides, yep. Okay, great. So yeah, so as John said, my name is Sean Brown. I am currently the director of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center at Carnegie Mellon and the University of uh, Pittsburgh, as well as Vice Chancellor for Research Computing at the University of Pittsburgh. So yeah, as John said, I, I was a part of MIDAS for a long, long time, somewhere around 10 years. Uh, uh, doing, I, I led an effort called Mission, which was trying to interject best practices in software development to alleviate many of the problems that we uh, we heard about in the previous two uh, uh, panelists' uh, presentations, as well as I ran a machine called Olympus, which was um, a high-performance computing cluster for Midas. So um, learning a lot about uh, how do we get adoption in the epidemiology community. But today, uh, given the email that John sent me about this panel, I'm taking a bit broader perspective. Uh, it is very much informed, though, by the time that I spent as working in uh, computational epidemiology. I uh, spent a lot of time during H1N1. I was actually embedded in uh, BARDA during the H1N1 pandemic, working with all of the researchers in Midas to try to do modeling and response to uh, government questions. And I was very heartened to see in COVID that there were a large consortium of people trying to help the government as opposed to lowly old me sitting in a desk in BARDA trying to run models that night to get decision makers answers the next day. It was, uh, I, I called it being in the belly of the beast, uh, but all of the, the concerns that I heard earlier definitely, definitely resonate with me. And I think um, they actually are trends that are not just unique to epidemiology and to disease response or public health, they are also uh, there are also trends that are growing in the overall broad broad community, as, uh, not just in disaster preparedness or emergency computing. It's across the board. So I've also been working in a lot of, as John said, in a lot of different areas, and now I'm a service provider and was uh, uh, have been working with the national cyber infrastructure and in Exceed, and that's where my perspective uh, comes from. So some of the trends that I'm seeing in the user community, because the, the question that you asked me, John, was uh, how do we get greater or how do we uh, bring more, uh, broaden the participation of HPC in the community? And uh, so some of the things that we've noticed in the user community are as computational research is growing in complexity. Uh, you know, your work was already highly complex to begin with. Uh, you know, you have uh, with epidemiology, we have very complicated and complex experimental designs, as uh, Fred was alluding to, and as the Scenario Hub is trying to actually facilitate and make easier for people. Uh, back in the day when I had to do this, it was uh, me and a spreadsheet, and uh, that spurred me to learning how to make computational platforms so that I never had to use Excel again. Uh, so that led me into a life of orchestration and data sharing and data collection, data analytics platforms. Our data is becoming far more complex when you're adding in across the board, uh, you know, social media, uh, neuroimaging, all sorts of different data types. 
in various uh, forms of standardization. Uh, and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to make data easier for people to use and make it computable and make it ingestible into new algorithms. And, and finally, complex collaborations. Computational research is no longer just the purview of the lone scientist sitting in their lab working on one problem under one deep discipline. It requires, to solve the real grand challenge problems that face uh, computational science today, it requires a village of people that are working in various and sundry different disciplines, talking to each other, learning each other's language, learning how to effectively communicate and work together on computational models. This is definitely evident in the epidemiology community where when we were working on models, we weren't just working with uh, mathematicians, we were working with geographers, clinicians, uh, immunologists, uh, computational scientists, mm -hmm. uh, physicists, believe it or not. So you name it, we had that kind of uh, expertise in our uh, coll collaborations and it took a long time to learn each other's language and understand how to work together. And that's a very big complexity that researchers have to face today. Um, it's, it's hard enough to work on HPC architectures when they're all the same thing, uh, but HPC architectures have grown quite a bit in complexity over the last uh, five years. It, it, there was a trend that we were moving towards more homogeneous, uh, high-performance computing architectures where all the machine had one type of processor, one type of memory, and a file system. Now uh, we've got new uh, and exciting architectures coming out that are far more complicated than uh, on the CPU side and the accelerator side. You know, we're we're, we're going back to things like FPGAs, uh, new AI accelerated platforms that are are highly complex. Uh, GPUs, CPU. The CPUs are becoming more complex as we with multiple cores on them. We're going up to like things like ninety six cores. Uh, per CPU, this is going to create a lot more complexity for the user, and we have to we have to be able to address that. Uh, as well as almost every modern HPC architecture now is not homogeneous; it is a set of heterogeneous resources to work on complex workflows under one framework. So almost every machine is made up of some capacity capability, some GPU capability, some large memory capability and different file architecture. So it's becoming a much more complicated uh, place to work, even just on one machine. Um, there are lots of new ways to interact with HPC resources. Uh, generally speaking, over the last uh, you know, 20 years, the primary interface has been uh, the, the command line, secure shell command line. Uh, we have a, new, uh, a whole new way of interacting with the computing. And the kids today don't even, you know, you're lucky if, especially if you're working in a public health department, you're very lucky if you find someone um, that comes in as a graduate student that's even seen a command line. And they're, they're much more interested in using things like RStudio or Jupyter Notebooks or web-based platforms um, or math, uh, or uh, MATLAB. And these are, we, so we, we have to be able to connect the high-performance computing to these systems and give, the, give researchers that idiom for them to work in as well. And also on top of that cloud interoperability, there's uh, a lot of resource need, and you know, as big as Xseed was, we still weren't saturated. We were, we were, we were certainly not saturating the need, and we were saturated with the number of people that had to request time. Our machines were always constantly full, and cloud provides uh, a way, another another avenue for doing uh, research computing. But I will say, in my perspective as a resource provider, as well as working in campus computing at the University of Pittsburgh. Cloud computing is not a panacea for research computing. I mean, uh, and I'm not even just talking about the cost of doing cloud computing. It's also the complexity of it. Um, our feedback that we've seen is whenever we've tried to get researchers to use cloud computing, they almost have to become their own system administrators to build. They have to build their own architectures uh, the, in these things. And if anyone's ever had to be exposed to, say, AWS or uh, Azure in its full glory on their websites, it's, it's not a simple space to operate in. Uh, and there's been several shifts in the community where we've gone from uh, non-traditional, we've, we've incorporated a lot of different non-traditional uh, computing resources. Epidemiology would be probably considered one of those uh, non-traditional um, HPC users. And the, the requirements are very different from, say, molecular dynamics or weather modeling, where you're, you're generally, you know, these codes are very mature. You can scale them across the machine. 
uh, pretty easily and they're very well adopted by the community. Uh, some of the non-traditional users like AI and machine learning epidemiology, they have very different requirements, much more reliance on accelerator technology or large memory applications as well. Uh, more reliance on services. So instead of you know, building all of your own software, there's canned frameworks for a lot of these, as well as service-oriented architectures that allow you to connect to different resources in, in novel ways. Uh, interactive computing has become very popular as uh, Kat was talking about, you know, it's a lot easier to develop on the same system that you're moving, your, uh, you're doing your production computing on. And new technologies like virtual machine, well, they're not new, uh, but technologies like virtual machines and container containerization have made this easy to port uh, those kind of environments to, to production systems and high performance computing. Uh, another issue would be is that emerging communities this is back to the, uh, also what Kat was talking about with discoverability and finding the resources that you need to do, that, knowing they're available. And many emerging communities don't even know they need high performance computing or what is available in the high performance computing world and how it can apply to their, uh, 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 their research. And increasingly, uh, these new communities are not speaking the language that us high performance computing specialists that have been in the game for like 20 some years speak and it's very it, it, it requires us to uh, speak in different terms and and sort of simplify our message but also learn how to speak to different scientific communities which is actually a very daunting task believe it or not so uh, John specifically asked me to talk about exceed so for those of you that do not know what exceed is exceed has been around for the last what 12 years John um, it is the what's that? 11 come the end of August. 11 come the end of August. Uh, it is the overall national cyber infrastructure that is funded by the National Science Foundation. John Towns is the uh, principal investigator of it, and it involves a number of uh, high-performance computing centers and computational research uh, people around the country providing a number of different services. And uh, overall, in my opinion, Exceed has been extremely successful, probably one of the more most successful national cyber infrastructures ever created. And I have had the pleasure of working in other countries' cyber infrastructures, including uh, Canada's and working with the European Union. And uh, it's funny, when I, I, I started at the PSC, I was a part of TerraGrid and Exceed, and I, you know, I'm in my game and, and always complaining about the problems that we have with Exceed. But when I went out outside of the um, Exceed community to other cyber infrastructures, they were always talking about how great uh, Exceed was. They were always holding Exceed up as a banner of what a cyber infrastructure could be. And we've made a lot of strides in Exceed and making computational resources available to the community in a much easier uh, fashion, as well as scaling people up and providing them support. So some of the things that I think were successes and broadening community participation in Exceed were the Campus Champions Program uh, it provided a scalability or provides, because um, Exceed isn't over, uh, it provides a scalability in, in creating champions across the community. Uh, that's another area of scalability that we don't often talk about is how do we reach more people? And that requires more person time. And what Campus Champions did was find people on campuses that could actually be champions for accessing Exceed. They would give them allocations to allow researchers on their campus to easily get to, uh, access to the computing resources, as well as support and uh, per, gave them a person on campus that they could talk to, to bring into the fold. And I thought that was a very successful uh, program. It's brought many, many users into the HPC community, especially non-traditional users that didn't have that connection on their campus. Uh, and we only had so many people in Exceed to go out and extol the virtues of high performance computing and research computing to campus. This is a very successful program in creating a new community. Uh, advanced user support, or what we call e EUSS, um, was also very successful, uh, very popular program because it gave researchers the ability to get actual people time to embed into their projects to improve scalability, enhance their workflows, or get started on the resources. And that, that was a big benefit to the community. And especially when we were moving up to novel um, types of computing, they, we didn't have those kind of um, 
people around on laying around on campuses. And this provided the community real support, real train, real user support, that uh, real uh, FTE time to help them enhance their projects. A very successful uh, part of broadening participation in the community. Our training programs, I think, were very popular and very successful. Um, we had a um, we have a remote classroom capability, a wide area classroom capability that was a hybrid approach where we had satellite institutions that had tutors on site helping people get through hands on exercise and stuff. While we had uh, remote capability in terms of lecturing and bringing in expertise from around the the country and around the world to train our users and create a new class of uh, very highly talented uh, research computing programs. And then finally, novel and innovative projects. We actually had people uh, dedicated to finding new communities, which it sounds kind of uh, intuitive uh, when you think about it. If you're trying to broaden participation in computational science, hey, let's get some people that are focused on it. And uh, before that, before we actually minted that, that really wasn't a focus. We were really sort of heads down focused on helping traditional users uh, use our resources. And uh, I think the novel and innovative projects component of XSEED really pushed the envelope of people that were using uh, the different resources available to us. Some of the challenges that I think um, we didn't necessarily overcome in XSEED, uh, again, I want to state that I think XSEED Succeed, was a very uh, successful program, but um, when it comes to things like allocations, uh, that was something that was always uh, uh, a critical point of the community. It's main, the main user interface. It's the main entry point to using the resources because whether we like it or not, our resources are finite and we have to have a process that uh, uh, gate keeps who gets on the machines and some justification for them getting on the machines. Um, for traditional users, this worked very well because the way the allocations were set up is that you knew exactly how much computing you needed uh, for a year or multiple years of time. And for like a, a molecular dynamicist or a chemist or a physicist, that's sort of easy. We have well-defined codes, well-defined workflows. We know what we want to do. But when it came to some novel communities where you have to do more exploratory uh, uh, work, such as uh, epidemiology, I mean, you don't necessarily know where the model is going to take you. And you have lots of scenarios to develop. And they're emerging. When you're thinking about emergent response computing, like what we do in COVID, you have no idea how many computations you really are going to need to do over time. And so our allocations process didn't really, uh, really work for that kind of community. It's AI and machine learning is the same way. It's more exploratory computing. And so we, we need to address that better in the future to get wider adoption by novel communities. Um, our user portal uh, was great as a single point of contact uh, for uh, the, the user community to be able to access the machines and ask for computing and get support. Uh, one of the things that I think it was, uh, it, it tended to get complicated uh, very quickly. Uh, we had lots of comments on how could we simplify that process. So I think that that's one of the challenges we have going into the future is to make this the, the allocations process and the access to computing as intuitive as possible and incorporate, um, we, we want to get users through the user, the, the give us your information and get on the computing as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, so we'll hopefully be adopting new, uh, new ways of doing that in the future. And adaptability was something that I think was a bit of a challenge in Exceed. Uh, we, we were a very large organization and we, we, you know, getting, changing, making grand changes to how we were doing things required a lot of consensus building and a lot of testing and change management. And um, it, we probably weren't as agile as we could be. Those are overall, or I would consider some minor challenges um, to what Exceed was doing. Uh, I think the good certainly outweighs the challenges when it comes to getting uh, wider adoption of HPC. But the, uh, some of these all echo some of the challenges that I heard in the previous two panelists' uh, uh, presentations, for sure. So moving forward, uh, some of the things that I, 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 from my perspective, I think we need to do, we need to have HPC be more user-focused. And when I say that, I mean, um, 
we have to get out of the mentality of scientific, uh, that this is a scientific computing endeavor or a research only computing endeavor. Uh, software development is very, very important. I've heard that again from uh, Fred earlier that, you know, I, and I've worked with Lyle, well, some of the codes I've worked with in epidemiology would uh, make your hair curl. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, putting a little, you know, thinking about doing more professional service oriented stuff rather than it being uh, the code is the model and the model is the code. And that's not unique to, uh, that is not unique to epidemiology. That's something that happens in scientific computing quite often. And we need to think about going from the idea that I'm providing you bridges to. That's, that's kind of what I talk about when I, when I talk about my resource providing. I have a machine called Bridges 2, and I'm providing that to talking about what are the services that we provide and how do you access those services, uh, rather than it being about the resource that you're running on. Uh, creating new interfaces to help uh, that meet users where they are. So talking to users and inverting the process of just saying, here's how you interact with an HPC resource. Instead, asking them, how do you want to interact with an HPC resource and developing those ways for people to come into the program and be able to do their, uh, their research. Um, providing platforms that help to manage the complexity of the research and uh, because it is becoming more complex and it's, it's going way beyond, you know, give your, your graduate student Excel and a, um, and a terminal and, and go to town. I mean, we have our, the, growth, the growth area of computing on Bridges 2 right now is people doing a ton of simulations and then they have to use machine learning to actually understand the results that they have from the simulation. So we're, we're even going past being able to take a bunch of ASCII files and si synthesizing some meaning out of them. We're having algorithms help us to synthesize the meaning out of our simulations results. And also uh, develop more training and I think it's really important that we incorporate uh, uh, research computing and practical research computing at the curriculum level. Most of the students that we have coming into uh, the research computing world get it sort of by osmosis or secondhand by the research. They, they get a research experience that lets them do research computing. We don't really have a lot of universities that have a formal curriculum and how to practically do Computation that mostly sets is, is set in the workshop world. And I think that uh, we were doing something at CMU. We've actually um, minted a research computing uh, master's course to teach um, science students uh, a, a follow on uh, two years that teach them practical computing and practical data analytics and practical AI and machine learning to help them become better computational scientists out in the research world. Uh, we need to make HPC more ubiquitous. Uh, most users don't really care where they're running. Uh, and we, again, that kind of speaks to providing services rather than providing uh, you know, actual machines and focusing on the machines that we're running on. Uh, we we wanna make it so that the users are doing their work, not worrying about what machine they're, they're using at the time. Uh, seamlessly integrating on-prem and cloud services into one ecosystem so that it's a ubiquitous resource for researchers. Uh, is a good future direction to make the whole thing less daunting and provide needed resources to everybody and allow and building software platforms that are focused on the research work rather than uh, the low level details of how to run uh, uh, run co codes on HPC resources is definitely needed to make the, the, the platforms more ubiquitous. And then finally, some of the barriers that I see removing that need to be removed in order to access HPC resources creating an allocations process that is not onerous, that doesn't require very large proposals or rewriting your proposal or very detailed estimates of time in order to get access to resources. We can, we, we can do this through different mechanisms uh, that allow us to still gatekeep the finite resources but do, and, and limit what people can have, but don't make it so that they have to upfront tell you everything that they need in order. And we've learned that we can do this through the COVID-19 consortium. I mean, our estimations of what people needed in resources, and we were able to ramp that up really quickly, were fairly light. And we were still able to service that community and not disrupt everything that all the users were doing. So it's definitely worth, it's definitely possible for us to do this. Um, allowing people to access the ecosystem with as little effort as possible. So I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm paraphrasing, make it easy. Uh, and I think we should make it as easy as possible, but also making it so that they do it the way that they do it, not the way that we want them to do it. We want to, we have to morph how we let people interact with our resources 
in the way that they need to do it in order to do the research. Uh, allowing allocations to work for both production and discovery-based computing, which I've already spoken to, you know, making sure that we're not uh, precluding people that don't know exactly how much resources they need, whether they're doing development, whether they're doing AI, machine learning, or epidemiology. That is a growing use case that we have to support. We cannot require users to know exactly what they need up front going into doing their research. And I think this is something that's very important and something that may not be uh, popular amongst the, the, the NSF community at the moment, but I think that we definitely still need in-depth user support. We need consultations. We need people that are dedicated in there to help new communities grow into this space. Without those people, it's very hard for, I mean, yeah, there's lots of stuff on the web. It's really easy to go to the web now and get like a Coursera or something in high performance computing but it doesn't replace the people element. We have uh, through Exceed and through the supercomputing resource uh, centers, we have a staff of people that have been working for 30 years in helping people get on these resources. And I think that that's a, a resource that we that's very precious to the community and needs to be for, for uh, uh, needs to be continued in the in the future. So that's that's it for me. I'm happy to answer questions and uh, involve in the panel. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sean. That was great. Um, all those presentations were fantastic, um, and you did an, a most excellent job in, in, in responding to what I asked you to do to cover the, the, the waterfront on these things. Um, again, I thought it was important that we, we touch on things beyond just preparedness for a, for a pandemic, because nationally, we need to be prepared for other types of crises as well. And uh, a lot of your points touched on those, those broader issues. Um, we'll move into questions now. Madhav is already ready to go. So Madhav. <laughs> and you should you get the privilege for the first question, John. So if you want to take the do the first question, then I can I can I just want to let you know that. Well, I, I think I'll take that privilege. I did want to ask uh, uh, Kat a question. Um, so uh, all of the all of the panelists talked a bit about um, how how obvious or not the advantages are of, of HPC. And from the researcher perspective, it's not always clear. It might be from those who are experienced in HPC uh, what, the, what the benefits are, um, but, but trying to relate to the researcher why it's important for them to consider this is, is a fairly challenging thing. And one of the ways that you might be able to, to, to express that to them is what would be the benefits to something like um, the Scenario Hub if the modelers were actually using these larger scale resources? And I didn't know whether you could Maybe share what where, where, what advantages would you have have enjoyed? I think through leveraging those resources in that way. Yeah, I mean, so we, as I said, restricted ourselves to four scenarios per round, and I would have very much liked to double that at the very least because quite often, you know, so I come from a background in decision making. There's a decision theory side, operations decision theory side, and what I'm interested in is the actions, but quite often we were pushed to bound uncertainty across two axes, and so we just have uncertainty axes, and if we could have also had a double it in size and had an intervention, because I personally think there are things that quite often you don't need to know what's going on to make a good decision. And people waste a lot of time trying to study something they don't need to study. Um, so that's just my personal bias. But there's that. And then I think our fastest round was 17 days, which was our second Omicron round. And it's because we re-ran with the same architecture, same models, just different parameterizations as we got updated information. But normally we have a, a, a roughly monthly um, timeframe because some of the models take a good chunk of time to code up, calibrate and run. And anything that would speed those processes up would speed the whole thing up, of course. So um, there are actually multiple, multiple ways that this, if it was like, if we knew, oh, in five years, there's gonna be another pandemic, let's get everything set up, right? Um, and you, you know, had the buy-in for it rather than people going, oh, no, we need to move money to something else because this has gone away now, which is what generally happens. But assuming that we had that buy-in and you set it up in advance, you could streamline this vastly. Um, but I would come back to points um, that Sean was making about the incredible importance of this being flexible because... People, you know, so I started in physics. My undergrad was in physics. I was taught by physicists, so I started in Pascal. 
apart from one astrophysicist who made me do Fortran for a bit, right? So I'm dating myself. I ran my PhD on a 286, except I could borrow the postdoc's 486 over the weekend. So my wall time was when he walked into the office on Monday morning. That was my high my performance computing, right? Okay, so that's my background. And I've, you know, grown up through these things being more and more available. So I, I know, and actually all of the people in the hub know a bigger computer, faster computer, all is better, but it, it's true. So from the scenario hub point of view, it's truly, truly, truly about making it easy. But I think the flexibility so that if I had come on, wanted to do it in R, because epidemiologists use R because you can program and run mechanistic models, but also do your statistics in R. It's very, very flexible for other reasons, right? So if you know that and you can have flexible software and then the wall time issue is nobody knows how long it's gonna to take to run because things like an outbreak, the run is over when the outbreak is over, but you don't know if you're gonna have something that fades out or something that blows up and runs for three years. And so you don't know in advance. All these things you were talking about, Sean, about flexibility is really, really critical. And I loved your point about service, which was my point about a person, because sometimes when you're overwhelmed, you just need someone who knows how to do it and just to do it for you. Like, this is what you do, bing, bing, bing. I know a lot about it. And it just makes it happen super quickly. And you don't have to learn how to do it yourself or waste your mental bandwidth on something where you could just shift it across so I think if we knew it was coming and we were going to do this all over again we would plan exactly as you're doing in this session set a lot of stuff up but do not I really strongly do not suggest you push for common software or common approaches because the diversity of opinion is actually critical when you're faced with uncertainty so we deliberately in the scenario hub are spanning across uncertainties um, this morning at least one person mentioned that the oh nick reich the forecasts are heavily overconfident individually it's only by spanning across multiple opinions and you know this right if you're going to go and cut your hair you maybe ask your spouse if you're going to change your job or you're looking for a doctor that's going to support you when you have cancer you ask everybody you know who's got experience on it because it's consequential the decision you're making is consequential and you need massive input because you know there's a lot of uncertainty and you take opinions from multiple people that's why we do this multi-modeling stuff the diversity of their um, encapsulations of their idea about the science is, is often placed in, um, you know, it's a network model or it's a branching process model or it's something I can, a compartment model that I could code up in Excel or it's something I could stick in R or something I need, you know, um, something more so the Python or whatever you want to be coding in, right? So, you know, you just have to give people that flexibility that their scientific opinion can be realized in the resources that you provide to them. Or I'm gonna start using services. I love that, Sean. So I think that's where we need to move to streamline this and think of it as, as, as helping us to do a better job in time of crisis by planning ahead so that when the crisis hits, everything's ready to roll. And it's, I hate, you know, paraphrasing military-ish type stuff, but, you know, Eisenhower apparently used to say something along the lines of, the plan is nothing, but planning is everything. And I think that is so apt in this because even if it never falls out the way you think it was going to, the fact that you set everything up and thought through all the idiosyncrasies in advance just makes it happen so much more fluently when it actually is needed. That was maybe a bit longer than you wanted. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I think that was a great uh, response. And, and Madhav, I'm gonna take one more privilege here because I wanted to ask uh, Fred a question. Um, you, you and, and Sean made some comments about the growing complexity of the, uh, of, of the resources that are made available because of the emerging technologies. And uh, at the same time, the point was made by all three of you that this needs to be made easy, said one way or another. Um, is there hope for us with a growing complexity and, and a need to make it even easier to use? Can we get there? Um, so I think so, but it's not. Um, it won't look the way people, it, it won't look the way it does now. Let's put it that way. I think we're, I mean, I think as Sean correctly pointed out, the, 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 the both the, the resources and the models that are being built to utilize those resources are getting increasingly complex. I mean, you know, when, 
Certainly when I was a grad student and for much of my early part of my career, workflow management were two words that were never actually put together, right? I mean, you, your workflow was that you got up in the morning, got a cup of coffee and ran your code, right? You know, this notion that you were going to, that, that, that you needed to organize the organization was, you know, on the machine was not something that would happen. On, on the other hand, you know, the, the, the projects I'm leading now with the National Cancer Institute and with others, workflow is the game. I mean, proper workflow is how you're making the whole thing uh, you get there. So I think that we will get there because th- we're just now in the world where we're creating all this. I think there will be, I mean, Kat said we shouldn't have standard codes. I completely agree with that. We might standardize a little more on frameworks and things that, that we're, we're, where people have an understanding of how this happens. People are making this up right now. That, that they'll get more practiced at this. But is it ever going to be simple, simple? I mean, no. I mean, look... You, so flying a jet plane is very different than driving a car. And we've had both of those technologies around for a long time. And flying a jet plane is a lot simpler now than it was 50 years ago, but it's still not as simple as driving a car. On the other hand, you can do things in a car you simply can't do with a plane. So, I mean, you can do things in a plane, other way around. Do things in a plane you simply can't do in a car. And so if you really need the plane, then you better freaking well learn how to fly it. I mean, that's, that's, how, that's how, and we can make that as simple as we can, but it's never going to look like you know, running a Python code on your laptop. It, it's just not. Uh, and, sh- and I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't say it shouldn't. I wish it could, but I, I think that's unreasonable. But we can make it as easy. As, what was it Einstein said? As simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, uh, I, I, think, I think we can get there. Great. Uh, Madha, I'll throw it to you now. Okay. Thank you so much. I mean, these are beautiful questions, John. So thank you very much for asking. I wanted to make a slightly longish comment and then a question. And I, the reason for this comment, I wanted to take this chance to thank Kat for organizing along with the colleagues, the scenario modeling hub, which was so crucial and important. So thank you very much. And to John and, and Sean for giving us a chance to use the machines. I think ours is the only team that is using HPC uh, in, in this particular form. And I, I can, I really want to go on record and say that it was simply not possible if we had not gotten access to the machines at uh, Exceeds, at the at PSC Supercomputing Center and our own supercomputer here. So, and I think given that Fred is now in charge in some ways to, to work this out for the future, I think this is, a, this is an, important, an important breakthrough that we have demonstrated that it's at least possible to use HPC resources in close to real time now and within the decision-making framework that CAT and others set up over and over again uh, productively. Doesn't mean that we don't have challenges. Doesn't mean that everything worked out. There are lots of problems all over space, but as Nick said in the previous uh, thing, we have come a long way from our from our experience during Ebola and H1N1. This is a serious improvement. And I, I really hope we continue to do this. So my question following that was, was twofold. One is, you know, I, and I've used this term before uh, in another meeting, and I'll use it again because I think it's apt. I think as, as, as a population, our memory is somewhat Markovian. And so what's going to happen, I, I'm afraid, is that after this round is over, uh, we will neither have the you know, energy left or the funding to, to continue to do this work in some form. And so all the things you've learned will... And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it, it will happen and I hope it doesn't, but I'm, that's my concern that this will sort of stall somewhere. And so when the next round happens, we would all look back and say, I, we wish we would have done this. So I wanted to see what you all feel, you know, how we could keep, go, you know, keep going with this. We have our colleagues from NSF, we, have, you know, we, have, we had colleagues from you know, CBC before and, and you know, you're, you're here, Fred. But I think this, this aspect is really important. The second part that I think I wanted to bring up as a question to you all is, and I, I'm, I just, I decided to title this as a, as a title of my next paper, which is modeling complex systems with complex models using complex machines and writing complex software. That's really the, really the story here. And, and sometimes it's needed as, as you all said. Um, you know, we are still figuring out when it is needed. But do you do you all think that this this reality? I mean, in physics and chemistry, 
at DOE labs, nobody would argue that these machines are useful. Here, this argument still persists, and for a good reason. I think Lashmi asked this question to the audience again, but I would like to see where you think, because in my opinion, actually the models have to get even more complex from where we are. We need to add immune system modeling. We need to add viral dynamics into this picture. We need to have economic and social impact into this picture, because without this, we really cannot be solving the real problem. We have learned in, in this pandemic. So I wanted to put this as set of questions to you folks uh, and thank you all for, for sort of helping us. You know, without that, it was not possible for us to do what we did. So Matt has posed some big questions. Who'd like to take a shot? Well, I'll, I'll start with a piece of it. Uh, I'll, I'll expose a little bit of, of a chat that Kat and I had offline, which, which was exactly looking at, you know, uh, asking the question, what, what, you know, what, what happens in the long future? I mean, what happens if, if interest in this entire field sort of goes away, you know, two years from now, you know, knock on wood, we're completely out of the Omicron woods, you know, and, and, and you know, BA2 is, is a thing of the past. Um, and then people are just, they're done with this, right? And they want to get on with, with, with other parts of their research. No one's interested in doing this anymore. That could certainly happen. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how, how long interest uh, persisted in the research community after, what is it, you know, 1918, 1919, 1920, when, when the Spanish flu subsided. I mean, that was a, that was a you know, a, a killer event. It, would, it certainly grabbed the entire world's attention very much the way this one did. How long did the research community continue to engage in that field? It would be an interesting, an interesting discussion. I would, I'd like to say that at least from my viewpoint, the, the, the CFA that was, just, that was just created under the CDC is supposed to be an institution in perpetuity, right? It was, it was stood up to handle this with the understanding that that need is, is going to be persistent. Um, time will tell, of course, because that will be dependent on funding, funding from a uh, 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 mercurial Congress. So we will, we will see how that all plays out. But at least on paper, the intention is to build an institution whose job it is to look at this even when, when no one else is looking at it, right? Um, and and I agree that that you know the comment about you know the plan is useless, but planning is everything. I, I think that that really is true. I mean, having having thought through some of the pieces, so that even though we don't know exactly what's going to happen, we know we know sort of how we might approach it, and we've already like practiced doing that. I think that that's going to be very important. Um, to your last point, Madoff, about about complex codes on complex machines with complex software, looking at complex models, I. I I, I could not agree more. I think that that's exactly where we're going. Uh, uh, and I, and I, one of one of my missions at the CFA is to help is to help them think through how does one connect things like economic modeling, which which it, you know no one wants to do. It's kind of a royal pain. Talk about modeling human behavior. That's like modeling human behavior squared. Uh, but nevertheless, you're exactly right. If we want to address some of the issues that get brought up in the middle of a disaster, you have to, you can't pretend that that's not an issue. And so you need to be able to address it in some way. What is the right way to address it? Those models are complex. Scale is something we're not going to be able to get around. I mean, you know, we, the numbers are no longer that scary. With the computing we have right now, we could easily, easily build, uh, for instance, an agent-based model of every individual in the United States. Boom. That's that's not crazy. That those are doable. Those aren't asking. Those aren't even financial numbers, right? Those are, those are completely doable numbers. How do we calibrate such a model? Now, now we start getting into the tricky tricky bits, right? But from a purely mathematical standpoint, this is not undoable. And so, starting to think the unthinkable thoughts. How do you build these crazy models that are no longer crazy with the level of computing we have, and starting putting the pieces together? I think that is going to be our challenge for the next several years, and it's going to be it's the. the Complexity is going to be the word. I think that's right. Um, Kat? Was maybe Sean was there. Sean, you were ready to go. It looks like you were on mute. Go oh, ahead, I, um, I, would, I would say that uh, definitely after H1N1, which was a much different situation uh, than COVID, that we did the, the exact thing that you just stated would uh, we didn't want to happen, happened. We kind of completely forgot about all the stuff that we did. And some people were working, still working on it. Midas was still there. We were still trying to build things like that. But I think that this, the, um, the right thing is in, in this case for this to occur 
it, it's not really only the academic community that has to buy into it. I think that the work that uh, Fred's going to be doing at the CDC and what's been going on at the CDC and uh, their ability to facilitate and uh, um, coalesce a coalition of academic researchers to help uh, answer these questions. Uh, one of the challenges was in I, that, uh, that I, I saw in H1N1 too, uh, versus what I've seen in COVID is data sharing has to be ubiquitous. Uh, and we should focus more on, instead of necessarily only thinking about how do we run these models, how do we get the data to people much, much quicker so that they can go out and do, as as Kat was saying, you know, uh, it's not really a competition. It's a, uh, it, there's a lot of value in people making their uh, models full of assumptions. There's no way around it. Otherwise, it would be reality. Um, and so it's very helpful for multiple groups to be doing this. Uh, so it's not just about the computing that they need. The data is actually far more important and getting that out to people quicker and in a format that everybody can use. So talking up front about data standards and how we can agree upon where this data resides and how we'll access it is actually probably more critical than how do I put my model on an HPC resource? This is from my perspective. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I have three points that are interrelated that get at several parts of this. Um, the first is that I do think you should expect interest to wane, for example, in the CFA. I mean, I see it, I do outbreak control for pests and plant, you know, plant pests and insect pests too. And what happens is there'll be a horrible new pest, people, you know, USDA or whatever throws lots of money at it. You do some stuff, it bashes it down a bit. And it's then the next one pops up and you pay attention to that one instead. And then you're surprised that the first one came back when everything that pushed it down was context dependent, right? So um, I see it repeatedly. I'm endlessly astonished that I see it repeatedly, but I think you need to plan for it. And so what you would think about for the CFA, for example, would be to, in, what do I need to stick? And what can I afford to have be a bit wobbly and maybe fade in and out of it? And I think then, when I was reading all these adoption literature things, I actually read a book called Arresting Contagion, which I recommend, which is about the history of the Bureau of Animal and VAI, the Bureau of Animal Industry, which is a precursor to the USDA, which was before the CDC. And it is how, so animal health um, achievements, and this is not modeling, right? I'm just talking about animal health improvements were made, it was for animals before humans right just think about that for a second and it was done using a lot of these adoption things but very informally and then it was set up and it was done at a state level and then finally federally and that was a precursor to the cdc and so if you want something like that to set up the cf in the cfa and for these um computational resources to be sort of entrenched for perpetuity and enlarged through time you might it's well worth looking at how that sort of eventuated it's a lot about networking it's a lot about having influential people um, talking to other influential people and influencing the people that then adopt the the strategies but then what, the other thing what was the book what was the book again it's Pat? called arresting contagion arresting by roads and block and it's very long you would just skim it i'm, I'm you know but i'm telling you some of the punchlines from it. it's well worth a look all right thank um, you but then the other thing i would like to flag is i disagree that models always need to get more complicated. I'm not saying that they don't sometimes, but I think it's predicated on answering the right question. And let me give you a little example, which is several times in my research now, we've developed models um, and variants of those models, if you code them yourself or you ask the groups, like we do in the Scenario Hub, to say, how bad will this get? So you're asking for projections of numbers or burden of some sort. The answers will be all over the place. But if you say, here are five things we could do, which of these should go ranked in what order? There will be a lot of agreement. And we've seen this now for livestock diseases, for Ebola and for COVID. And I actually think we waste a lot of time writing more complicated models to try to fit things more exactly when actually what we should be doing is asking a somewhat different question about what do we do to make the impact as small as possible. Those, that's, and, and actually often then you can get away with fewer models or 
simpler models that just get at the gist. And there's a big literature in theoretical ecology on how complex does a model need to be. Simon Levin, I don't think he's on, but he's a contributor to that debate. Um, and he's involved in prepare. So, I mean, there's a big literature on these ideas and it depends on your question. And I think what we forget is we're so keen on saying what will happen that we forget to say actually what we're charged with is what do we do to save people's lives or what do we do to save people's hosp you know, hospitals from collapsing or people's livelihoods and that asking the right question may allow us to sort of simplify our models in some settings um, and then maybe use those resources or services provided by computational facilities to to ask more questions or more subtle questions that kind of answers so that has several points to do with Madhav's question. So. Um, any other comments from folks? I, I, I have something to say as well, but Madhav, go ahead. No, no, just wanted to thank all the panelists. It was a very nice set of answers. Yeah, so I'll, one other comment for, for that last bit of discussion. Um, I, I'm also very concerned about what happens after this crisis uh, fades. <clears throat> um, there has been some action taken to try and address that, mostly on providing the computational resources. So some folks may be familiar with an, uh, an effort that has been started by the Office of Science and Technology Policy out of the White House to create something that's being called the National Strategic Computing Reserve. Now, this doesn't solve the problem that Fred's going after, which these things would have to work in tandem, actually, I believe, to, to effectively respond to uh, a future pandemic crisis. But there at least is thinking in, in, in the higher levels of government about having the resources available so that when a crisis occurred, they can be called upon. So this speaks a lot of to what uh, Kat was talking about. Be ready for this, you know, and, and work out as much of that as you can so that when it happens, you're, you're executing on a plan which will fail. But at least you've thought about the sorts of things that can happen and you can recover quickly and move along more quickly. So this is sort of built on a model of something like um, the Civil Air Reserve or, or, or other reserves that the, that the US has to make sure that there's a, a standing capability. And that, of course, that will only be successful unless things like uh, the work Fred is, is going to be heading up is paired with it in order to actually respond, to bring the researchers and the cap and 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 that side of the response to the table. So I feel like there's a little hope, but I'm also equally concerned that, that after the crisis has passed and everyone's exhausted and they're trying to breathe again, um, they just don't have the energy to move things forward, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, did you want to say anything else? Mana, just one quick point. I mean, you've just okay. seen already that in the latest appropriations, all the money that was originally set aside for COVID just got shifted to Ukraine, right? So you know, we're already seeing it. We're yeah. already seeing it. We shouldn't be surprised. We should be planning for it and just, you know, anticipating, of course, people's attention spans get pulled to other things. They're not all doing what we do and therefore not as entrenched in it. And so okay. then they're, they're just bear that in mind. So um, as Madhav did, I want to thank all the all the panelists and, and those that were participating here and, and, uh, and, and listening in on the conversation. Um, I think it was a really excellent uh, set of comments uh, and, and discussion points that were made. Uh, this, uh, this panel will, is recorded, so it'll be available and we can share it with others in the community. Um, I suspect there's been a number of folks who've been watching it on, on YouTube as a live stream. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that there were folks who were able to hear this conversation and, and think about that as they move forward in their own work. And uh, Madhav, did you want to say anything to, to wrap us up? Yeah, just 30 seconds. For Thanks again, John, for, for organizing this panel and thanks to the panelists for a very lively debate and, and their presentation. Uh, we have two more panels tomorrow uh, and hopefully you folks will join us. Uh, we, as I said in the first panel, we plan to collect all this into our uh, reports of sorts and, and send it to NSF, uh, you know, because the intent is that, you know, we try and um, NSF looks at it and hopefully decides to, you know, have programs that support some of the some of the things that we all had discussed as important questions for us to to work on because I think it's an important agency to to do this. Fred, maybe you can take it to CDC and convince them as well, uh, you know, in, in doing that. But I leave that to you. But thanks again. I think John, this is absolutely a wonderful wonderful meeting, and I think 
It's apt today, you know, we as I said again in the early part, Jack Dongera got the ACM Turing Award for, for panel computing. So we could not have had a better uh, panel, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, the topical area. Uh, and hopefully we'll continue the HPC 